Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. This show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, is currently a finalist for a Coalition of Visionary Resources Awards, and was listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top best 20 podcasts to listen to this year. Very grateful for all of that acknowledgement. And a little bit later, I'm going to bring, be bringing on my guest today. I'm very excited about it because Lisa Haysha is here. And she's going to be talking about her new book, Soul Blazing, Transform Your Imposters into Superpowers and Live a More Purposeful, Authentic Life. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. If you need healing, if you want to become a facilitator, if you want to go to a program, you can almost in any country. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger and I run a visibility hub. What that means specifically is I teach you how to write a highly engaging book. I also turn books into international bestsellers, and I show entrepreneurs, speakers, and coaches how to be interviewed on podcast and radio and get massive results. I'm about to teach a weekend book incubator, and if you'd like to get more information, you can go to my website, debbiedashinger.com, and write to me there. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. Love to have you join us. That's going to be the week where you really figure out the architecture of your book, and we start to build it together with guidance. So are you ready to soul blaze and transform your life? My guest is Lisa Heysha, who is a life coach, speaker, and author. Her latest book, Soul Blazing, is out now. Lisa teaches workshops live and on Zoom on how to befriend your imposters. Authentic life, know your story, and soul blaze your way to abundance. Lisa's traveled to over 60 countries, gaining wisdom from spiritual leaders and healers, from the Bedouins in the mountains of Petra to the Sufis in Cappadocia. She is also the host of the Amazon shows Soul Blazing with Lisa Heysha and Soul Blazing with Master Teachers. For more information on Lisa and all of what she does, go to soulblazing.com. And with that, I welcome Lisa to Dare to Dream. It is so great to have you. Hi, so good to be here. Thank you. I think I... Uh, really bastardized that the name of that country, the Sufis and Cappadocia. How do you say that? Cappadocia. Good. Ah. Well, you did actually very well. Most people can't pronounce like five or six of them. So <laughs> we did our homework. <laughs> Yay. It wasn't a stuttering bio. I'm very grateful yeah. for that. You know, I told you before we started the show, I'm a little jealous because I've got that travel bug inside of me. And to read that you have done solo travel experiences to over 60 countries, was it all for work? Was it personal? How did that work out? Both. I got sent places. I was working for a company where we did trade shows and I was the English speaker for a ball bearing company in robotics. Mm -hmm. So they originally offered me, you know, two or three nights there. Cause it was just a weekend. I said, no, 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 no. I need to do seven nights. Otherwise I can't make it. I can't just turn over that quickly, go to a country and come back. So anyway, that was our agreement. So I got seven nights paid for it. It was a Japanese company. They were very generous and that lasted for about six years. So they sent me everywhere, you know, like to Xi'an, China, you know, Prague, you know, Russia, everywhere, Hong Kong. So then when I was there, I would either stay there or then bounce around to a few other places mm -hmm. and these other places. So that was great. And then I modeled in Tokyo. And when I was there, I left the country and then came back because of visas and all that. So I went and stayed in different countries. And when I finished, I traveled for about a month all over Asia. And, you know, so you just make it work. And then sometimes I'll have friends come visit. I'll go travel someplace like for two weeks on my own and have someone visit for a week or two. How has travel changed your life? Being in that many oh. countries, meeting that many people, how are you different because of it? 
One of the main things is you watch the news and hear all this stuff going on. Then you go to the country. We were just talking about that before the interview with Chicago. I just spent time there and everyone's like, be careful, Chicago, the highest crime. So I was over there like, careful, here's my mace and whatever I need. And I mean, nothing. And I was there daily for four months and I saw no crime. I felt safe. And so I think fear is alive and well, and that we keep getting promoted, you know, promotion, uh, fear, fear, fear. And when you go someplace, I think it's how you carry yourself for one. Mm. And when I started traveling, I had, I am naive first time traveler. I was ripped <laughs> off everywhere. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, day three, my purse was stolen while at a restaurant day seven, mm. I bought some food and having a coffee stolen Day 12. I'm in a overnight train with my doors locked. And somehow they came in and just took mine at the top and took mine at the bottom, my suitcase <sighs> and my backpack. I had two other people in the room. Theirs weren't touched. It was just like, pick on her. She's, yeah, it was just crazy. I'm like, what is going on? Now I realize, oh, because I am naive was written on my forehead, first time traveler. Now nobody bothers me. It's like, oh, she's seasoned, don't mess with her. Now you just know how to look and have eyes behind your head and you walk with maybe a little more confidence and you feel like you fit in more compared to, oh, where are we? And what's this, you know, <laughs> touristy stuff. So it's better to be a traveler than a tourist. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you've got a little bit of a New York vibe going on because we, I, I'm from New York originally, Long Island, albeit when you go in the city, you, you know how to carry yourself yeah. and you're safe when you do that. Absolutely. That yes. But travel is, I think, the best teacher in the world mm. because there's no other school that introduces you to so many people and you get to, you know, I teach soul blazing, which is really about the imposters and putting on your masks. And when you're here, you put on so many masks. Oh, I'm an actress. Let me put on that mask. Oh, I'm with family. Here's this mask. I'm with this friend or a date. We all were just trained to um, be liked and be hired, be cast, whatever. So there you get to like strip off everything and just be you. And so authentic, you just, I share things with strangers on buses or trains that I would never share with sometimes close friends. It's not like I have all these secrets, but it's just, a, it's just about feeling safe, you know, because you'll never see this person again. Yeah, I think that's really interesting when you talk about the different faces and beings that we are out in the world and you call it imposters. It sounds like identities, right? Yes. Putting on the mask and taking it off. And what's the piece about being an imposter? People want to put on different masks to feel safe. I read something about Joanne Woodward. You know, I researched a lot of actors. She said she had 16 personalities. <laughs> Then she said, yeah, she said, once you learn to take off those masks, she became free and won the Academy Award. Mm. And I thought that is fascinating. And I think it comes from all your childhood wounds. Anytime you're hurt or you're scared, you go, oh, I need this protection to survive. Now I need this protection. So we start developing these layers and then you come across to the world as not authentic. Mm. And when you're not authentic, people feel that. And you know, when someone's, you know, feels comfortable in their skin or if someone's scrambling inside saying, I don't know who I am, who are you? I'm trying to mirror who you are because mm -hmm. I want you to like me or I want to fit in. And it's so obvious. So once you actually learn who you are, know who you are and like who you are, that's when you're unstoppable. And that's when your authentic soul could rise up and really run the show. Got it. It's interesting. I have a quote from Coco Chanel that I'm thinking of as I listen to you. And she said, hard times arouse an instinctive desire for authenticity. So the opposite, based on this Joanne Woodward story that you tell, is that when we remove all the masks, what is left is us, right? The authentic us. And I would say, that in the past couple of years, we've definitely experienced, it's, it, it constitutes as hard times. So is there something that's very up to date with where we are right now on the planet and humanity that there's this current need for authenticity? And if so, how do we get there? Well, you start by buying my soul blazing book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you get there by practicing. 
This is not something that happens overnight. Um, I discovered seven imposters, you know, like your victim, your overthinker, your egotist, you know, all these different imposters, your fixer. I like to equate it with they live on the stage of your brain and they're running the show, pulling your strings for you. So when you put your foot in your mouth or you're making a decision or you over talk, over share, don't share enough, all these things are your imposters protecting you. Oh, I'm going to manipulate this person. I'm going to have them like you. I'm going to create this. But what it does is, again, what we were talking about keeps you in insecurity and not in your authentic self. So regardless of what you're saying and doing and showing off, um, you, it's not authentic. People don't like that. They'd rather say, God, you know what? I'm going through hard times or this is what's happening. Not just here's another accolade, another accolade, another accolade of mine, because that's not real. Because even if you're doing really great, we all also have, you know, stuff we're going through, you know, someone's dying of cancer or COVID or, you know, this happened to your child, or we all have all this other stuff that we don't bring up because we're going, oh, people won't like us then. It's not that you have to dwell on it, but you should at least have it be a part of who you are, you know, coming from that real place. Mm -hmm. And if you could actually start loving yourself, you don't need those imposters. You have them, you have them work for you. Like I was on a audition for a teriyaki burger and they said, here, I want you to do this and this. And it was a Japanese commercial. I want you to sit down and we want you to eat your burger. Um, and then we want you to, we're going to ring a bell. We want you to walk across the room, answer a phone, talk, eat your burger, walk back to the room, sit back at your computer and type up and then say, oishi desu. Then I'm like, okay, not too hard, right? So I sit down and then I'm like, oh, wait, am I supposed to be chewing? It looks weird if you're <laughs> and typing or do I put it down, type, pick up, chew and think, what do I do when I'm walking? Do I chew and walk or because it's about the burger? Hi, you know, all this going through my mind and I go back and I sit down and I just go, um, uh, thank you very much. And I'm like, oh no, because in Hollywood, as you know, thank you very much means you suck. Get out of my office. I never want to see you again. You're on this list. You know, and I went, oh my God. And I went at 9 a.m. super like excited because it was an open call. So I went home, beat myself up. What did you do? I can't believe you did that. And my ego just is saying, I could have done a better job. My overthinker saying, stop that. And my victim saying, I screwed it up, of course, again. So I'm doing all this. And I go, I'm going to go back. Because my egotist was so strong. You got this. I can't believe you messed it up, victim inside. So I decided to go back and I changed my hairstyle, changed my clothes, brought my other headshot. You know, you always have two or three. And I went back at the end of the day, one of the last people. So when I walked in, they said, oh, you look familiar. I said, oh, I work all the time, you know, <laughs> before I was like, oh, I'm excited to be here. I haven't done a commercial before. This will be fun. That's like, oh, I work all the time. You must have seen me in some commercials or whatever. So they took my headshot and I go, okay, nice. They're doing this. And someone tells me what to do. And I knew what to do. And I practiced at home. So I just was calm. I was in my body. I was in my mm -hmm. authentic soul. And I just sat there and then took a bite, thought about it, got up and did it, came back. And I said, oh, very good. And then the casting directors were going through the pictures. All of a sudden they go, aha, you know, like I caught you. <laughs> Here's your picture. And I'm like, oh my God, that's my, I have a twin sister. Was she here? She's a terrible actress. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, she was here. I'm like, oh my God, please don't blame me. I studied here and I studied there and I did. They're like, okay, okay. So we laughed and they, I left. And by the time I got home, I got the call and got the job. <sighs> And that was a $25,000 job. And that is a great example of your imposter. So if you live from your authentic soul, your imposters could actually work for you because they're tamed like a pit bull. If you tame them to be an attack dog, they're the best attack dog, but they may bite you, turn on you, turn on your friends or escape, jump the yard and go bite someone. But if they're tame, they won't do that because they feel loved. They know their role, just protect you if someone comes in your house or you're under real threat. So that's your imposters. If you could tame them to say, work for me and protect me when I need you and not have them open their mouth, you know, your mouth and speak out of turn, whatever, then your whole life works out. And just trying this on people, I've worked with over a thousand people and I started writing down what is the main, you know, imposter that they come from? Where do they live from? And I go, oh, you know, I work with a lot of Hollywood, you know, people I worked on sets. And 
So I'm going, oh, these people work from seductor, man or woman, and men want to keep me chewing people or I have power to do this. Women go in there and, you know, I'll do anything to get the part or they dress a certain way. So I'm going, if you could just stop coming from that place, because then there's shame and guilt. Then when you have that layered on this and that, then you have less confidence. Oh, I just got that for that reason. You know, all these things come out or the fixer who sits at Starbucks. I had someone just the other day that I was sitting at Starbucks with my friends who were talking about the Kardashians. They do nothing. And just because of their mom and Kim did nude stuff or had sex on camera, they became famous. I'm like, uh, no, there's a lot more than that. And why are you sitting at Starbucks complaining instead of building your own life? Mm. So fix her, oh, I've got to do this. My dad's sick. My grandfather did this. I had to do this. I caught no break. I had no money. So they start fixing other people so they don't have to dwell on themselves. But all of them have a positive side to them if they focus on that and say, why am I saying this? Where is that coming from? You know, why do I feel a need to criticize others? Why don't I just focus on me and build me and not say an unkind word about anyone else who's successful, even if I feel they're not deserving? That's your imposter talking that they're not deserving because your authentic soul knows everyone's deserving and everyone could have what they want. But you have to be clear within yourself and you have to like yourself. Oh my and gosh. if you don't, because I've worked with people who are successful, they don't, they're successful, but they don't like themselves if they didn't work on themselves and they blow their money on, you know, Coke, drugs, whatever, bad decisions, bad, you know, hedge funds, whatever people that they trust getting business managers. So they, everyone who I worked with like that, they lost everything or that they were miserable. Well, you know, that was incredible. That was so comprehensive. Part of your list really surprised me. So I didn't realize that somebody you mentioned, someone who overshares or somebody who puts their foot in their mouth. Yeah. So I want to understand that from both perspectives. The first one is, let's say it's you, anyone listening, me. I'm at a, an event and, oh my God, you know, maybe I get nervous, whatever's going on, or maybe I see someone across the room, I'm not comfortable, I know them, I had a bad experience, who knows? But there's some kind of background story that makes this altercation within oneself, we're no longer coming from authenticity. And suddenly there is this blah, 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 that is really unsavory to everybody's ears listening. And, and a strange, you have to admit, it's very awkward. We all know what's going on. And so let's say it's you though, and you're really a good person, but you're having an awful moment. How do you recover from that? How do you identify I'm doing this in this moment? And then how can you make a shift in a situation? God, you are so brilliant. What a great question. Um, that has happened a lot and that comes up a lot. And then what that does is it compounds your shame, mm. and guilt, and I'm not good enough. Cause then you go home and say, why did I do that? And then, you know, you're not getting a call from that person or you're ghosted and you know, you did something, then that compounds it. Cause you think, oh, maybe they didn't notice. Maybe I'm building it up in my head and it's worse than it is. And usually it's not. So what I advise is for people to then go back to their authentic self and create declarations. I, I don't call them affirmations, declarations of who are you write down the quality that was the cause of why did I do this? What's the ugly quality or the insecure quality and then change it into something positive, an I am declaration. And then you write down those declarations and you record them on your phone and audio and listen to them every morning and write them down every morning, you know, 10 of them, 15 of them. And then you start becoming that person. And then you, when you're feeling strong, maybe give it a couple of days, I would call that person or text and say, Hey, I need to talk to you for a few minutes. Something came up and just try to make amends and oh. just own it and say, I was insecure around you. You know, I really value you. I think you're wonderful. And I wanted to please you, or I wanted to be friends, or I wanted to whatever date you. And I really feel silly with how I behaved. And you'll be surprised at how people go, oh my God, thank God you said that. I didn't know how to even talk to you because it would have been <laughs> inauthentic for them to talk to you. One of my clients yes. said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm like, you have to do it. You have to, because now there's weird energy and you'll see each other at other events because it was like a work thing. I go, you have to clean it up. And once she did, she said, that's what the person said. Oh my God, I didn't know how to face you. I didn't know, 
if you knew, I just thought that's who you were. And it was just now we have, yeah. So now we're going, thank you for owning it. Cause now we could move forward get it. We've all had weird moments. Oh, totally. I, you know, yeah. so I did once I was going to a workshop. It was a big deal. And, uh, when I was registering, the one of the women completely in charge of this very big, like a healing kind of workshop operation came up to me with somebody else very qualified in the organization. And she suddenly started paying me all this attention. How are you? How's the hotel been? Whatever she asked, all I know, I must have been so like, there's a Yiddish word, I must have been so famished, like so beside myself that she, oh, like, really? I'd love to tell you. Well, I've been working out. I've been... (laughs) I, I just remember the look on her face as I kept talking, like literally was like a cartoon, but I was mortified because I could see on her face that I was going blah, 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 blah. I sounded like a crazy woman. And for some reason I kept talking about working out, which made me sound even crazier. And it just ended with this horrific look on her face, disgusting energy between us and yes, mortified, ashamed, what the F is wrong with you, Debbie? And I just remember, wah, 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 you know, this, the walk of shame. It's yes. a, it's a, a long enough ago, but it still is like a reference point. And I want to say like, out of compassion, what if I'm in that situation and somebody does that now hearing what you're saying, Lisa, it's like, oh, like all of that's going on. They're not a bad person. They're just, you know, having this aberrant, emotion that they're not sure what to do with it. How can people show up for somebody who starts behaving awkwardly and isn't their authentic self instead of shaming them or giving them a weird face? Right. And that's a beautiful thing to ask also, because it does work on both sides. We're both that person and we're, and we've all been on the other side. Mm -hmm. And if you say you haven't, then you're not being honest. You're not your authentic soul. Because if you're living life fully, we're all in situations where we just tune out. We've got so much going on. Um, I think it's a beautiful, I feel it all the time because of my job. I see it all the time. Even if I have an event and I say everyone could talk for two minutes, someone's going on for 20 minutes about blah, blah. And I'm like, how do I pull them? And, and I go up to them and I tell them this exercise. And another one is like talking to your authentic soul, writing down your authentic soul and your, that imposter that did it. So finding out your imposter. And when I say that is finding out what aspect of you needs to be loved in that point, what happened to Mm -hmm. you in childhood that in this situation, it's coming up. I need to be seen and heard by this person. I'm not, I don't feel seen and heard. This person, damn it, is going to see me if it's the last thing I do. So they think talking more and, and especially about themselves is going to impress the other person or make them see them, but it does the opposite. So writing down that imposter and give it a name, because if you name it, you could claim it mm-hmm. and go, okay, that side of me is, you know, whatever, Mary. So you write Mary, then I can't believe I did this. And I, whatever I spoke for 20 minutes about working out then authentic soul and give yourself love, Mary, I hear you, da, 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 you know, whatever. And I say, go outside in nature because nature tells you everything. Mm -hmm. That's the best life coach in the world. You just sit there and say, why did I do that? And then sit there and slowly it starts coming and you start writing. Remember conversations with God. That's what Neil Donald Walsh said. And I always go, that's just bullshit (laughs) that I was reading it 20 years ago. Now I'm like, ding, 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 ding. I get it because I started practicing it when I was traveling a lot. And then you get the right down the message. What did Mary need? The person who did that is your wounded inner child who's saying, please love me. Please like me. I want to be seen and heard. I'm not seen and heard enough. So what is it? What happened that day or that week or with that person in particular that you needed to do that with? Then have this conversation and then you'll come up with the answer of, okay, then I say, make an agreement. How can the authentic soul help Mary when that comes up again? And then you'll have the solution when you see yourself doing it, you're going to catch yourself and go, oh, that's Mary. Mary, I love you. You know, give Mary love. We'll talk later, but I'm going to speak right now or I'm going to not speak, whatever the moment is, but you're going to start catching Mary. Then Don will come up and then Steve will come up and Sue will come up. You keep 
getting them going, oh, my grandmother gave me that. This is from my mom. This is from my dad. This is from my, you know, whatever. And until you really clean yourself up. And sometimes people have so many that, you know, working with someone for three years, you're going, oh my God, bam, 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 bam. And not knowing who they are. But once they start going, I'm going, wait, who's that? That's like really a new personality. It's really like um, multiple personalities with this, but it's like minor leagues instead of major leagues. It wasn't your, whatever your issues were, weren't enough to really split your personalities, but enough to be inauthentic and not know who you are and feel you are not good enough. Once you feel you're good enough and like yourself and accept you, everyone else will. Mm. And it's the most powerful thing in the world that you'll cry when you go, oh my God, I actually love me. And I don't need to put on a show for anyone because I am good enough. I mean, what a powerful thing. And we're trained, don't love yourself. You know, it's not about you, it's about others. But if you can't love you, you can't love someone else deeply. You're always going to be lonely. Even if you have a partner, you're going to sabotage a relationship if someone's nice to you because you're going to go, I don't deserve this subconsciously, that imposter, and you're going to destroy it. So what's the point? Focus on you first. And it's not narcissistic. I'm not saying just be me, me, me and talk to everyone about you. It's a quiet thing. It's a personal thing. Every morning, get up, look at yourself in the mirror and the eye, you know, in the eyes and just, I love you. I love you and say your name and say that a few times till you feel it. Then go write down your declarations. I'm living in a strong, sexy, healthy body. If you're saying, God, I'm fat. Oh my God, I can't believe I blew it again today as you're eating chips again. <laughs> oh, I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> I can't help it. It's because we're so stressed out and unconscious. Even when we're, I know for me, even when I'm conscious, I'm unconscious. I'm like, okay, today I'm going to just drink fluids. And I put on like 10 pounds. Okay. And I know all this over the past three, four months, because I've been going through a lot, you know, I could tell you all these stories of all this stuff but the point is I'm going okay today's the day and then I go downstairs for a coffee and we had cake left over from my daughter's party I'm like well I don't want to waste that's icky and I go okay I'll just have a little piece then later if you cut them up in little pieces I don't know if you know this that doesn't count as a whole piece it's just you have little bites <laughs> so I did that the two pieces of cake that was left was gone by probably noon, <laughs> but I didn't eat them. I just had little tastes, you know, throughout the for three, four hours. I mean, I, that's been going on for like a couple of months. I'm like, oh my God, for my birthday, I wanted to look my best. I'm like, okay, I look my worst, but that's okay. I love and appreciate myself. I'll start after my birthday, you know, mm -hmm. but it's so we're, even when we're conscious, we're unconscious because something else bigger is going on. So you have to go, mm -hmm. what is that? And sometimes you go, you know what? I'm sick of being perfect. I'm sick of eating just salads and a hard boiled egg and this and that just to fit into that size four or six dress. It's like, you know what? I, I'm going through all this and I'm helping this person recover. I'm helping that. I'm going to let everything go and just enjoy. I'm going to have that pasta with bread, with mm -hmm. garlic butter. I'm just doing it. I don't care. You know? And I think that's okay too, because that's loving yourself. Being too rigid is not loving yourself. Then you can't, you know, sustain it, but just don't let it get too far out and go, okay, I got it. So slowly I've been writing down this past week. I'm going to start on Sunday, not Sunday, Monday. <laughs> I said Sunday, but Sunday spa day. So I'm going to start on Monday after the birth. I, it's my birthday this weekend. So birthday celebrations. Then I'm, so I'm preparing myself. Don't train your mind. We love our babies. <laughs> If we don't train our minds, then nothing's going to happen. You cannot keep any goal if your mind isn't trained. So that's what this is about too. So I think it's about training, not just your mind, but all your different personalities and getting them all to be one and work together as a team. Then you could pull out, oh, I've got that audition. Let me put on my seductor while in character, not be hi, how are you? And be normal in this. And then when you're auditioning, turn it on. And then they'll see the difference and then go back to thank you very much. And you could be a little charming this and that, or for a victim, you don't, you could go, God, I feel like such a victim right now, but you don't have to bathe in that. You could go, what is the superpowers of it? Super powers are beautiful. You know, you could be empathic, sensitive, loving. Those are great qualities. So don't stay in the, I it's their fault. And well, it's everyone else's fault because I had to take care of this person. They wouldn't, I had to drive back to Pasadena and back for three days. Then I have to, you know, be full on with this and full, full on with that, with all these different things I have going on. But it's like, no, 
I felt like doing what I was doing and it was a choice. And when you say it was my choice owning it, then everything switches. It's not the blame game. Then you get out of victimhood and you go into your superpower of almost like your egotist of I'm in charge and you stop judging yourself. And, you know, then when you're doing that, you start judging others. Well, look at them. They're this and that, you know, whatever you're trying to get to, you start putting down those people or family members or colleagues and because you start the jealousy game starts going on. So you start resenting anyone who's doing well because you feel you're not. So you start judging. And so instead of being like wise and honest and impartial, you become critical and domineering and closed-minded and I'm gonna get them and I'm gonna start talking badly about them. And you know that's not gonna work. Some goes, try this, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. Not for me anyway. It's just because you're just so um, angry and bitter inside. So you got to start shifting that because it's not really what's happening that you're seeing. It's your perception of what's happening that you see. We only see from our mind's eye, not what the truth is. Ooh, that was powerful. Mm-hmm. That's so true. Yes. So you're living a false narrative and you're owning it and you're like, oh, I've been, this happened to me and that happened to me. It didn't happen to these people, but it's not true. We've all had horrible things happen. We've all been rejected. We've all been felt bad. We've all put our foot in our mouth. We've all overshared. We've all been the ugly person. When someone did overshare, we all check out that person. Do you know what they did instead of going, oh, they're having a bad day. So what you could do to those people is give them a hug or just say, you know what? I see you. You're so beautiful. Give them a compliment and just, you know, then maybe even later, if you're close to them, you could send them a note and say, let's talk. Then say, just for your information for the future, this is how that came about. And I know that's not you. It's your imposter. So I know it's not you. So just, you might want to put that in check later, however you want to say that, but just giving those people a compliment because that's what they're searching for. They're saying, I just need to know that you know I'm okay and that I'm good and I'm great and I'm loved. So if you could do that, imagine if all of us worked in tandem like that, spotting each other's imposters and nurturing that person even more. And if you're the one doing it, not beating yourself up, just owning it, giving it a few days and just, and if you don't, can't talk to that person again, like if it was someone you met that you is not in your circle, you could let it go, but you could do it for yourself you know, or if you know someone who knows them and it it was important to you because you maybe said something rude to them by accident or, you know, then it might be nice to try to find their name because that's happened to people too and say, listen, I was out of line. You know, when I was checking in, I was, I beat you up because you didn't have my name on. You know, I was at a charity event and someone's name wasn't on and they're, oh, you're stupid. They need smart people here. And what are you doing? And I don't, I'm, I'm their best friend and I'm going to tell them to fire you. You know, it's like that kind of stuff. And it's like, whoa. So, you know, they're having a bad day or self-loathing and they feel like a victim. So they're judging others because it starts coming out. So if you've done that, it might be nice to find that person and say, you know what? I'm sorry. That was on me. I had a really bad day and I didn't mean it. And, you know. You know, there, for me, there's nothing more powerful than I did it. I'm sorry. That is the most beautiful words, not often heard, certainly not by me. And I know I pride myself as much as possible to do it. I had to learn, of course, I didn't come out that way, but I did have to learn and it's not easy. You know, it, it can come fraught with a lot of emotions behind owning something but the feeling of being so clean yes. and so present and so responsible mm-hmm. with another being, I think it's a priceless gift you're talking about. And it's a priceless gift to yourself. Mm. And then look who you could be in the world when people trust you, because if you're that authentic and really speak your mind, mm. and I'm not saying be mean of going, oh my God, you're fat or you're like dumb or you're look at you. You can't even do a simple job like this. Not being like that, but just saying, oh, you must be having a bad day. My name's really on the list. Is there anyone else that's here that could help me or assist you? Is there anything I can do for you to help move this? There's a lot. That's kind. kind. Yeah. Yeah. And what they probably say is, you know what? Just go in and we'll deal with it later. Mm. 
So, I mean, there's ways to do it. And you got to remember you are the author of your life and author means authority. So you got a writing your life every day, oh, right? Yeah. You are the writer director of your life. So write in a new story, say today, this is who I'm going to be. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now going, okay, my birthday. So on Monday, this is who I'm going to be now, at least for the next 30 days. You don't have to do it for a lifetime because we shift and grow so much. For the next 30 days, I'm going to go on a healing journey because mm -hmm. I've been there for so many other people the past two months. Everything like fell on me. So now I'm going to go, you know what? I'm going to have a birthday celebration and celebrate, laugh, have a lot of fun. And then I'm going to go, okay, now let me just... Let, I'm going to start working. I didn't work out for two. I'm going to start working out. I'm going to start eating right. I'm buying the food ahead of time and saying it's not a punishment and it's not a, uh, I'm not making myself suffer. It is about nurturing going, I'm going to eat this and consciously and smaller portions. I'm going to eat this because I'm going to love on me now. It's about me now before it was about them. And now it's about me, even though you could still reach out and be with other people, but I'm not going to eat that cake. I'm going to toss it or say, you know, give it away or something. It's like, okay, I'm done with that phase. Now let me get clear and move on to the next. But yeah. I feel it's important to, you know, splurge sometimes. I, I do. And I don't think it's bad to go up to a size eight or a size 10 or whatever it is, 12. If, if you're going through something in a way that could be nurturing too, but then get a handle on it. So you're healthy for those who love you and depend on you and for yourself. So you're living your best life. You can't live your best life if you're going to start having health issues, but then you just taper, you know, down on what you're doing and create a plan and a, um, a partner is great, you know, to check in with. Well, I've been in, in both places, you know, I spent a lot of time, I would say, I don't know when I started, but it was a very new experience for me last November through probably around March. Yeah, like eating whatever. And I have never been that person. And I have to say it was glorious. It was yes, really it was. freeing. It is. Yes. <laughs> I've been the no carb and the no sugar and the no, you know, for very good reasons, but I'm very good, healthy reasons, but to let myself go or have that piece of cheesecake and Wow, it, it was really amazing. Yeah, um, amazing. Cheese and French bread and you know, olive tapenade. I was eating that, you know, red wine. Oh. I love it. It's like, you know what? <laughs> I'm doing all this. I this is my thing. Dark chocolate with nuts, red wine, cheese, olive bread. Oh my God. So oh, you and I could tear up the town. I'm telling you. <laughs> and then I also know the glory of the other side of what you're yes. talking about. And I've always said for me with food, discipline yes. is freedom. Yes. And so there's also the freedom of, you know, doing something and I'm really feeling, you know, I'm feeling better in, inside of myself and I can tell I'm functioning better and more clear and and just, you know, these little things, but um, they're monumental, right? Yes. And so I love that both are available to us and I relate yes. very much to each side of this. And, and so Lisa, you've interviewed these really big transformational names, which is exciting. And it's called Conversations with Master Teachers and it's been a documentary. Are, were there any surprises when you interviewed people? Were there any moments like what we're having right now and what I'm having with you and some of the things you're sharing where you said, oh, that's an aha, or that's, that's something I never considered, or that's unexpected. And who was it who shared it with you? Well, Wim Hof, he's the mm -hmm. Iceman. He's incredible. And he shared doing a cold bath or even two minutes of cold in the shower or putting an ice pack on your neck, whatever is available to you just wakes up your body and makes you feel alive and changes your whole system and neural pathways. Cause it's shocking. And I thought not my thing. I don't <laughs> want to do that. But once we did it and got into, we got into my hot tub, but filled it up all with ice with him. Yes, he came to my house <laughs> and I invited Hilarious. 10 close friends to do this with me. Then he walked us through. So we did this breath work, breathing in, breathing out, breathe in, breathe out. And then we got into my hot tub, uh, which is now a cold tub. And it's like one toe, you're freezing, but you just go mind over matter and you get in. And then once you're in for about 10, 15 seconds, your body acclimates and it's like, cause he just strengthened your mind with like 45 minutes of breath work. And 
I'm in there going, this was impossible before this moment. I never thought I could do this. Then when the five minutes was up, I'm going, I could go longer. I could just sit here for a half an hour. It doesn't matter anymore because I trained my mind that this is healthy for me and I can do it. And then that taught me where in my life am I playing small of, oh, I can't do that. Like uh, Saturday, a, a woman is going to come and eat fire and train us. And she goes, oh, I want to teach you. So I have to put fire in my mouth. I go, no, 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 I don't do that. She goes, Wim Hof. I went, oh no. <laughs> she goes, it's mine over matter. So it's like, whatever fears you have hold you back, regardless of what it is, you have to slowly chip away at those fears and prove to yourself, I can do it. So that little you know, five minutes of my life altered my decision-making in business, parenting, everything, because it was like, when my daughter says, oh, I can't do that, or I don't want to do that, or this is too much, this is overwhelming, like with homework, but no, you piece it down. It's a mindset. Come here, honey, breathe in, breathe out, do this for five minutes. And now think about it, write down, what are you afraid of? And then she'll write down, oh, it's too much homework. My teacher always gives me too much, you know, whatever it is. And I say, what's the opposite of that? That's your victim imposter. Who are you? You're a straight A student. You got this. How do you do that? And she goes, oh, I piecemeal. I could just do this, this, this. I said, yeah, it's like, now it's like a ball of yarn in your head with blues, yellows, purples, greens, you know, so take them out and go, here's the red strand. Here's the yellow strand. Here's the purple. Here's the blue. Here's the gray. Here's the white. When you do that, it's not all overwhelming of, I have so much to do. I'm so stressed out. It's like, no, I don't. I have six things to do that are all about an hour 30 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, especially like with her homework. It's like, no, this is actually a three hour block and you have 10 hours to do it. It's Saturday. You have 10 hours. Do, you know, three now, take a break, do a five minute one and 40 minute one, take a break, do a 15 minute one, a seven minute one, you're done. And it's like, when she's like, oh, I can do that. I said, that's all it is. But when you look at it, it's just like, I'm doing none and I'm going to procrastinate because it's too overwhelming. So and that was really profound because it really is a beautiful way to live life when you're not living in fear or I can't, when you're going, I can do anything because guess what? You're the author of your life. And if you don't have a life, create one because you're in charge. You're the authority of your life. So it's creating, I'm a good student. I got this. I know how to do this. And she's like, oh, it's so much easier now, mom. I said, anytime you have stress, break it down, put the threat, the um, ball of yarn, pull it out of your brain and just start organizing the different colors. And then you'll know white is this, red is that, blue is that. And it just changed her whole way of doing homework. Well, that's genius. Uh, that really is. I mean, there's entrepreneurs listening to this who go into that frame like, oh my God, or, you know, I work with clients, they're doing new things, they're getting more visible, maybe they're about to speak on stage for the first time, or they're writing their first book. And of course, it's overwhelming, they've never yeah. done these things. But I love the people who are always a hell yes. And then other folks who feel all that trepidation, it's like condemnation prior to investigation, right? Yes. Exactly. And I understand it too. Before you do something, you've already decided I can't do it. And when in fact you're saying it's actually in pieces, if you can take yes. this chunk and a break, this chunk and a break before you know it, you are at the end and you have completed what you thought was not possible to complete. Yeah. And I like to break it down in a visual because when you're seeing the visual, like the different, I could say, oh, you just break it down. She doesn't get it by say, oh, look at the ball of yarn and here are the different threads and name each, should they get it? Just like the imposters. It was when I was teaching this, you know, 10 years ago, 20, since 2003. So um, I created in 2001, but it took me a couple of years, you know, to get my stuff together and then it kept growing and evolving. But when I used to teach about your ego is this, your ego is having you do that. People would still mess up. And once I go, let me break down the ego. Let me start talking to them and see what comes up. Oh, they really are a victim. They're coming from that. Oh, this one never stops thinking. I've got to do that. And then, and this comes up and da, 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 da. Oh, this one's just so critical. She's judging everyone, including herself. This didn't work. That didn't work. Why should I? My dad said, I'd be, I'm stupid. My mom, you know, all this stuff. So I'm going, oh, okay. So after working with, I don't know, I think I did this for about a hundred people or whatever. I found out which ones are the most strong. 
So these were the ones I said, let me just start there. I'm sure there's lots of other ones and work on these. And then as they come up with clients, if something else comes up, we could add that for them. But this is a great framework to just start from because then you go, oh, I'm the judge. I see it. So then when you start judging, you go, ah, my judge imposter, and you name it. Oh, my dad gave me that. He just judged everybody, you know? So this, so then you start going, okay, dad, I, I don't need this. I got the lesson. Thank you for sharing. And then you get it. Then you, then when you start seeing it, it's actually funny. And it's not, if, when you're doing it, feels necessary. I have to get this off my chest. I have to rip that person into a new a-hole. I have to like criticize that person because they're getting on my nerves. I have to criticize that teacher, that person. Someone the other day was going, God, I can't stand Mel Robbins. She's just so like five, four, three, two, one. How stupid is that? And just because she has contacts and she has, she's on all these people's shows, she gets to be a best-selling author. And I'm like, oh my God, how does that serve you? What is, how is that serving you? That's your judgment. How is that certain? What do you mean? How is it serving me? I'm just saying, you know, like other people are so much better, but why her? And it's not fair in life. How someone mm-hmm. create something so silly and oh, bestseller five, four, three, two, one, give me a break. And she goes, I try to do that. I still can't get out of bed. I just going, thank you, five, four, three, two, one. And <laughs> then I'm like, I feel like it's not because you're not getting it. It's not actually five, four, three, two, one to me. It is actually saying, train your brain to love yourself and say, you know what? I'm going to, I acknowledge you that you don't want to get out of bed, but let's do it anyway. It's a nurturing way to just give yourself time. And I said, what's brilliant about it is it's a visual in a way. It's a gimmick. And so just saying, just get out of bed in five seconds or just give yourself a minute and get out of bed. It's like actually doing something. So it's training your brain. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. I said, sometimes the most simple things are the most brilliant, but that you're focusing on that instead of focusing on what you're creating tells me a lot about you. So let's work on that. So your judges out, your victims out. What else? What do we got going on? And tell me why you had the need to share that and why you're having those thoughts. And then once we go there, it's like, oh, starts writing down. Oh, I put my book out. Nobody was buying it. I don't have enough money to market it. I wish I had, you know, all these top people putting me on their shows. And so, okay. So are you the author of your life or is somebody else writing your life? You know, I am. Okay, great. Let's start writing that. What do you want to create? But you're not going to create great pieces of work where these people are going to want to highlight you if you're too busy comparing yourself to everybody else. You're in competition with yourself, not anyone else. No one else could be you. You're you and only you could be you the best you can be. You can't, I can't be you the best, you know, you can be, you are. I can't be Angelina Jolie better than she is. She's Angelina Jolie. I can't be Oprah. Oprah's Oprah, but I can be Lisa. And what is Lisa's gifts? And how can I keep improving my gifts maybe by stealing some of their energy you know, I have, you are the five closest people you hang out with. So I, up on my walls here, I've got Pablo Picasso. I've got Angelina Jolie, Aubrey Hepburn, uh, Maya Angelou, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Anais Nin, you know, Gandhi. So I'm soaking in their energy and going, God, I love Picasso's creativity. I love Aubrey Hepburn's humanitarian work and her sophistication and style. I love Angelina Jolie's commitment to you know, her humanitarian mission. It seems like she's really, with everything she's got going on, she could balance two or three lives at once. I don't know. I think that woman has a week in one day. <laughs> I don't know how she does it, but she somehow manages that with a brew of kids. Um, you know, I love Simone de Beauvoir, who just created the first writings about what feminism is and being a woman and just popularized that and made it brilliant and Anais Nin, how vulnerable she was that she journaled every day and shared her thoughts with the world, her deep intimacies, because even the ugly side, because we all want to look good. I'm like, oh, she showed everything. And she shared that she's married to two men for God's sake. She's, you know, who does that and talking about her affairs. And so, I mean, I love, but you, so you just take a piece of how much of that do I want? I love Oprah Winfrey, how she started, you know, conscious conversations and brought on all these people and shared with the world, all this information we would have no idea about. So let me just tell, oh, I want to add that. I want to add this to who I am and start focusing on that. Mm. Create the imposters of that. Oh, how in this moment can I bring in a little Aubrey? How can I bring in a little Oprah? 
how can I bring in Picasso when I'm doing art for my party? I thought, oh, I love creativity. So I called one of my artist friends and said, you know what, let's have a canvas and everyone just create on it together. You know, so you're just, when it's in your body, now I'm feeling it, it's in me. So I'm starting to create it in my life. So it's not just a God, I wish I could be like him. I am him. I'm creating this event with all these multiple personalities and talents. And, you know, that's my canvas is bringing beautiful people together to share their gifts. It doesn't have to be exactly what they're doing. I have the Whispers from Children's Hearts Foundation where I donate money to now a couple of charities of choice. I used to go out there and do a lot more, but now I'm going, I don't unfortunately have the time because I'm not Angelina Jolie. <laughs> um, so now I just raise money and give it to like kids in the spotlight who are helping uh, foster kids write, direct, and star in their own plays. They write their own story and then they star in it. Then they go to the Fox studio. They have all these actors pretending like it's the Academy Awards and the best actresses, the best this. They get free hair and makeup and stylists style them and limos donate their services. It's beautiful. So it's like, oh, okay, that's how I can do that. It's a smaller chunk of what someone else is doing, but now it's a slice of me. I'm still, you know, helping. I'm going to go to Poland and work with, um, you know, the um, refugees from Ukraine. And I met a woman, got a month ago, um, at Spago's, I guess, um, I forgot her name, the owner of Spago, but they, she created this great Shabbat and someone brought me and the person sitting next to me is a person who goes to Ukraine and organizes it all. I'm like, oh my God, she goes, come great. So it's like, I'll try to go do that. So it's like, okay, that's part of this. So you just start becoming that. Then you start liking yourself. You're going, oh, my true self is being self-actualized. And even if it's small, bite-sized pieces, it's there. Then you go, which area do I want to expand? Which area is not working that I could let go? I thought that's who I was, but I'm going to let that go. But if you balance your life with mind, body, heart, soul, and work on every aspect, you will be whole and complete and you'll love yourself more. And when you love yourself, oh my God, you have so much more energy and you, people receive you differently because they're going, oh, you've got that secret sauce. You've got that it quality because you've nurtured it and you've um, developed it. So just in the morning, a great tip for people is do something for your mind, body, heart, soul. Look at yourself in the eyes and say, I love you. Talk to your soul, your authentic soul, not your personalities and connect and then work out. Even if it's just stretching two minutes of stretches, that's something for your body and do a lot more. If you can a walk, even five minutes every day, then make it 10 then 15 or not keep your whole um, morning routine to three minutes or five minutes. You could look at yourself for 30 seconds, stretch for 30 seconds write in your journal, three gratitudes and read something that's inspirational. You know, I have like 10 books next to my bed of all these great spiritual teachers. And I just open it sometimes to a paragraph and take that in, or I listen to a YouTube video. And sometimes I have an hour or two, and sometimes I have five minutes, but if you train yourself to do it every day, even if it's 30 seconds, you stop lying to yourself. I found one of the biggest things people do is lie to themselves. And they're such good liars that they don't even realize they're lying anymore. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to do this. And you don't, your, your mind's mm. telling yourself, Oh, you don't keep your promises to yourself. So this is, so this is bullshit. I don't have to yeah. do it. Just, she's just saying it. So your body goes, I don't have to do that. That's just our story. You know, we always say that, but we never follow through. So once you make your conscious mind and your um, subconscious mind connect. And that subconscious mind is your imposters where it's, you know, it's all the stories you put in, all the narratives, you know, your operating system and your conscious mind is your authentic soul. So authentic soul's like, no, take care of yourself. I know what to do. I'm the visionary of us. And your imposter's going, no, you're not. Ha ha, we're gonna screw you up and make you work harder. Then once they start getting alignment, Gary Zukov said something like that mm. on Oprah show in, or in his book, Seat of the Soul of when your personality is in alignment with your soul, that's when your life starts to work because you're not fighting. Your imposters aren't fighting your authentic soul all the time. When your authentic soul is, let's do something nice for ourselves. Imposters, I want to eat chips and watch TV. 
I want to watch show after show after show or binge watch Netflix, just stay on Netflix for like a whole day. And your authentic soul is going, no, no, I want to go work out, play tennis and all this stuff that you have in mind. Today, I'm going to play tennis three days a week. I'm going to do Pilates three days a week. I'm going to meditate every morning. I'm going to go out at least once a week with a friend and I'm going to meet Mr. Right or make my relationship stronger. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's not based on uh, your subconscious and conscious mind in alignment and making that agreement. And then when you don't keep your promise to yourself, you have to acknowledge it and journal about it at night. If you just spend even two sentences saying, you know, this is what I said I was going to do. And I didn't, why, which imposter was that? And why don't I love myself enough to do that? What popped up? Mm-hmm. And then you start getting answers and just wait, don't just write, write it, just think. And the answers come and then write it down and go, okay, got it. Then when you start to do that again, it doesn't happen. It, you have control of it. You're training yourself. So if you do it, it's a choice. Like I made a choice. I'm going to let loose for a couple of months. I just don't want to, I want to enjoy something in my life right now because all of this was challenging. And I just want to, I want to enjoy whatever I want to enjoy. So it's like, oh, okay. So now I have to enjoy loving myself, not on a diet. I'm going to enjoy shifting and treating myself in a different way. Cause now it's the season of, you know, uh, self-love. That was a season of loving others and allowing yourself the freedom to be a, you know, 10 year old kid again. And mm-hmm. just say, Oh, I want ice cream. I'm going to eat the whole pint and I'm going to this, you know, and I think that's healthy. I do. I, I don't think rigidity is the key in anything. Yes. Agreed. A hundred percent. Yeah. It was so much inspiration and all yeah. of what you just shared. Mm. You know, I got a lot out of it and I want to let people know two books, soul blazing and also whispers from children's hearts. And, and in this book, of course, the soul blazing, you go very deeply into some of what you described here. There's also something in soul blazing. There's an exercise that you have about writing a eulogy that you do with your clients. And you also lead the readers through it to write their own eulogy. I'm curious, is there an outstanding story of a client who did their own eulogy and what transpired afterwards? Oh, wow. Yes. Um, I did a retreat in Costa Rica, Mm -hmm. one of my first retreats. And there was this, there's about 30 people. And there's this one guy that was acting a little odd, uh, a little um, antisocial. He was probably in his early twenties. And when I had everyone do this exercise, he broke down. Everyone else was just doing it. And, oh, I want this, or I want that. And he was just breaking down. And then he left And we're in Costa Rica and he didn't come back. And I'm like, wait, I have to be accountable for everything. So I sent someone out to go get him. And they said, he's sitting on like a cliff outside and saying, he's going to kill himself. I'm like, excuse me. I'm like, show me where I'm like, sorry, when I'm going to, I'll be right back. Keep doing your exercise. Cause it's like an hour exercise. So I left and I went over there and I sat next to him. I said, what's going on? And he said, this is triggering me. And then long story short, because we don't have that much time here. The bottom line was that he murdered someone for money. And he said, and when I'm writing this eulogy, Mm. he said, I've never told anybody that. And I got away with it. And it was three years ago. And he said, I'm writing this and I'm picturing him up there. It's like meeting me and how I stole his life from him. And he was a dad of two kids and his wife. And he's like, how I ruined those kids' life. And I feel... I'm obligated to take care of those kids and I can't get my act together to even make money. Cause I have so much shame and guilt that he can't make enough money. He wanted to be a silent donation, like to his family all the time. And he said, I'd love to tell everyone I did it, but I don't want to sit in jail. So, you know, so he's like, I can't write this. Cause all I see is him going, why did you steal my life? And you, you know, I don't want to die. I can't do this. So we, I sat with him and said, you know, there's an exercise called soul, S-O-U-L, the acronym, you know, to stop. So I said, okay, just stop for a moment, observe what you're feeling, observe what you're going through. 
you know, and really get that down, then understand it. What are the triggers? You know, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. When you die, you're going to suffer. And when you're living, you're suffering. Cause he said, I want to kill myself, but I might suffer more because the eternal torment because I murdered. And then, so I said, okay, let's go through that. What's internal torment look to you. Let's go through this. And how about let's do forgiveness exercises. What, how can you, sometimes you don't have to admit what you did. You just admit it to yourself. So how can you make amends with yourself and make amends with them without admitting it then? So we came up with that. We did these forgiveness exercises that were specific to him. And then it liberates. So S-O-U-L, L is for liberate. And that liberated him because now he has a plan, an action plan. And then he came back to the room and he started finishing his thing. Then I had people get up and, you know, share, talk to me. So people were talking. Then he raised his hand. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't. We already like talked. You don't need to do that. He goes, no, like, please. I said, okay. And he got up in front of the room and shared that he killed someone. And he said, he's never done that in his life. And he cried and he shared the whole story with the group. And he said, I just feel really safe here. And I have to get this off my chest chest because I feel burdened. And everyone went up there and hugged him and embraced him. I mean, what are you going to do at this point? What's done is done. He was a good person who made a bad choice at some point. So now he started his amend story. And from that exercise that triggered everything, he's gone on with his life now. And I, I haven't talked to him now. That was like 12 years ago, but I haven't talked to him. But at that time he was making amends. He got the first job and then to move on to the next job. And he said, whatever I make 20% is tied to the, that family. And he feels that as long as he's alive, as long as he does that, he feels good about himself. And if he comes into bigger money, he would help with, you know, a bigger solution. So, I mean, that just woke him up. And so writing your eulogy could wake you up to things that are holding you back now by him suffering and just hating on himself and trying to be suicidal keeps him angry keeps him small if he could actually use that energy and shift it to the positive like all the imposters have the positive and the negative you know the superpower the saboteur change it to the superpower and going okay this is what i did if i could do that what power i have in me to do that equivalent of good in my life and let's start there let's start making the wish list then break it down back to the yarn, break it down. How do you now make this happen? Let's break it down for you. And once he did that and really started getting clear, he had a wonderful pathway and he's a powerful person and is making it happen. Wow. What an angel you were in that moment to spare someone's life and change, completely change the trajectory inside and outside of his life. And I am hoping the benefactors, that family and everyone in the room, everyone was just like, whoa, I'm blown away that he had the courage to do that, which made other people stand up to make him feel comfortable. You know what I did? Mm -hmm. I did da, 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 da. And I did da, da, And everyone started sharing their worst secrets of what they did and how they're humiliated in their walk of shame. Mm -hmm. And all of us were bawling because all of us were a little perfect that everyone got up there and said, you know what? I did this. I broke into a store. I broke into someone's house, my sister-in-law's house and stole her jewelry because I was jealous that she had it. And everyone's looking and they call the police and I took her jewelry. <laughs> so I did, right? Someone stole someone's wedding ring. You know, <laughs> they were traveling together and stolen and then blamed it on the maid. Then they had the maids come. So everyone's telling these stories and I'm like, oh my God, you people, what kind of people come to my workshop? <laughs> we're laughing going, oh my God, we're all messed up. We're all flawed. We are spiritual beings having a human experience and human means flawed. Humans means you're working out the bugs. Then you got to go, oh my God, I can't believe that. So I go, okay, everyone make amends with all those people. You can't necessarily give it back, but what can you do? And then everyone started working on that assignment and, mm. you know, just to clear it up in you because, wow. but that wouldn't have come out. Those people would not have shared that kind of ugliness to a room. That and then I had, everyone get it. I had <laughs> everyone get in a circle and then put one person in the middle and then everyone put their hand on that person and say kind things to them. Mm. So everyone then could heal. And then your turn, your turn. And everyone's going, oh, I love you. I see your beauty or I forgive you or whatever it is. And then that person's bawling and feeling it. So 
oh my gosh. They, so they got so much out, more out of it than what they came for. And all because this guy was a catalyst. He was brave. You were brave. You, you know, even knowing how to handle that, that would have been a lot for a lot of people. But the fact that you were able to step in and use the SOUL acronym and help him break down and make that kind of shift, I'm impressed. That that was momentous in the ripples of time. I've so, never been in that situation with someone like that at a workshop or retreat, not even since, but it's like, wow. Then for someone to feel that comfortable to share that. So Lisa Heisha, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals besides what's going down next Monday? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what <else> you <laughs> well, you're fucked. <laughs> Here's soul the book. Blazing. it's on amazon so soulblazing.com any other place where people should find you so, yes yeah, soulblazing.com amazon i'm on all social media youtube you could find a lot of videos and my interviews and my shows and um instagram linkedin uh pinterest i love pinterest <laughs> so anyway i'm everywhere yes Thank you so, so much for all of what you shared. I'm really grateful. I got a lot out of it. Mm, thank you. This was wonderful. You're very good at what you do. <laughs> You're really present and beautiful. Ask great questions. I'm really impressed. Thank you. Mm, what an honor. What a pleasure. You hear what you need to hear when you're supposed to hear it. And there was a lot in that conversation that was very good. Um, and especially, I just want to remind people of to put your mentors alive, dead, don't need to know them, but they have those elements of if you could be, this is who you would be. I love that. And writing your own eulogy so you can become that person now while you're alive and all the different ways we're imposters and how we can give ourselves grace and of course others and take ownership somewhere within. I end this show with this quote from Debbie Ford. The greatest of courage is to be and to own all of who you are without apology, without excuses, without masks to cover the truth of who you are. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation weekly Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. I love reading what you write. Get back to you as much as I can. Next week on the show, I am really excited. I've got some twin flames coming on. Shakina and Sananda will be here. They are world teachers, wisdom keepers, and golden age avatars. They are twin rays who teach the alchemy of divine union. And if you didn't catch on to some of what Lisa was saying, I think the point is you too. Whatever you've done, whoever you are, you too are divine. Thanks for joining us today.